I think it's a tragedy and a catastrophe that the left uh, has been has accepted the idea of humans as uh, historical products, simply reflections of their environment. Because what follows from that, of course, is that there's no moral barrier to molding them any way you like. I mean, if humans have no inner nature, if they don't have an inner instinct for freedom, you know, if it's not fundamental to their nature to have free, creative, productive work under their own control, if that's not part of their nature, then why, you know, there's no, there's no moral reason for allowing them that space. You could just mold them into being what you think they ought to be. And you can be the central committee or you can be the, uh, you know, the, the managers of the corporation or uh, the directors of a fascist state or whatever. And it's quite interesting that the intellectual, the modern intellectuals have mostly, have moved in one or the other of those directions overwhelmingly. Either they're, uh, and in fact this was for, foretold in one of the, maybe the only prediction of the social sciences that ever came so dramatically true uh, was uh, Bakunin's discussion of this in the late, in the late 19th century. He was sort of arguing with Marx, and it's well before Leninism. But he predicted uh, very perceptively that the rising class of intellectuals are just kind of becoming identified as a class in modern, modern industrial societies. Uh, he predicted that they were essentially going to go in one of two directions. Uh, there would be some who would believe that uh, the struggles of the working class would offer them an opportunity to rise and take state power in their own hands. And at that point, he said, they would become the red bureaucracy who would create the worst tyranny that humanity has ever known. Of course, all in the interests of the workers. That's one direction. And he said the others uh, would recognize that you're never going to get power that way. And the way to get power is to associate yourself with what we would nowadays call state capitalism uh, and just become the servants of its ruling class. Uh, and then you become the managers and the ideologues uh, and so on for the state capitalist system. And as he put it, those people will beat the people with the people's stick. In other words, they'll talk about democracy, but they'll really be beating the people with the stick of democracy, which they'll turn into a mechanism of coercion. There's some who think you can get power by, by exploiting popular struggles, and there are others who see that you're going to get power by just associating yourself with the people who already have economic power and that's largely dominate. And I think that was a very accurate description of the century that followed him. Uh, on the one, this is 50 years before the Bolshevik Revolution, but he predicted its form very precisely and also its ideological background. And he also predicted quite accurately what happens in the modern state capitalist industrial societies. And looking at it now from the retrospect of 100 years, uh, we can see, I think we can see this development very clearly. And it also explains an odd fact about 20th century intellectual life, namely how easy it's been from, for people to shift from one position to another. So the same person who's a Stalinist apologist one year is a super American patriot the next year, supporting every atrocity and uh, working and working in the Hoover Institute and you know associated with most reactionary institutions. That transition, which sometimes is called the God that failed change, which was sort of authentic in the early years, like people like Silone and others, you know, there was something authentic about it. It became a joke. I mean, as, as when people within the, in fact, we're seeing it in Russia right now. The, the worst commissars are now the ones who are most passionate about the, you know, the free market and investing and enriching yourself and so on. It, they've made the transition very easily, and that goes way back. And I think the reason is there's no transition. It's just a different estimate as to where power lies, but the same ideology. The ideology is you beat the people with the people's stick, and we're going to do it. And in fact, if you look at modern democratic theory in the West, it's remarkably similar to this. It's remarkably Leninist in its character. If you think of modern democrat, the leading tendencies in modern democratic theory in the West, so in, uh, in, in academic world, it would be uh, the strands of political science that develop from the thinking of people like Harold Laswell and others, one of the founders of modern contemporary political science. And in the general sphere, the Wilsonian 
intellectuals, the so-called progressive intellectuals, of whom maybe Walter Lippmann was the most uh, striking example in the United States, progressive intellectual in the 1920s, uh, if, uh, who do, all of these people develop theories of democracy, and they're quite interesting. They're very Leninist in their character. The conception is that in a democracy there's two classes of citizens. There's the general public, who Lippmann calls uh, ignorant and meddlesome outsiders, and Laswell says they're too stupid to, we should not be overcome by dogmatisms uh, about the common man who's too stupid to be able to do anything. That's the standard view. So there's these people, the ignorant and meddlesome outsiders, which is maybe 90% of the population. And then there are the responsible men, the wise men, you know, the smart people, um, the uh, people with integrity and honor, or the intellectual aristocracy, whatever you call them. And they have to rule. They're the ones who make the decisions, who do the thinking, uh, and so on. And the role of the masses, the ignorant and meddlesome outsiders, is just to show up every couple of years, uh, decide which of the smart guys is going to be their leader, and then go home. <laughs>